I'd like to call this meeting to order. First, I would like to announce that this meeting is being recorded and ask if there's anyone in the audience who is also recording this meeting. Seeing none, if we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have no public comment. Um, we have a 7.05 hearing scheduled, which we're about four minutes early for. So I will entertain a motion to move up item 6.3. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any Aye. opposed? So voted. Under gift acceptance. the fire department um, gift account from Mastermans, we have um, two hundred dollars. Is there a motion? Motion to accept for gratitude. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Then we also have. I'll entertain a motion to move up item six A two, drain layer license, right core concrete and civil. Incorporated. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. So voted. In your packet, we have an application for a drain layers license for Rycor Concrete and, and Civil. They have met with the sewer department. Um, the company has worked in the town of Auburn. They are recommending the issuance of the drain layers license per the Board of Selectmen's policy. There is no requirement that they be here for this. Is there a motion? Make a motion that we accept the um, application for the drain layers license for Riker Concrete and Civil Engineering. Incorporate. Incorporate. Is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Um, do we have the time? Is it 7.05 yet? That, that no. clock is off. We have 7.03. Under Board of Selectmen items, I'll entertain a motion to move up 4A. I'm sorry, 6A4, the proclamation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. We have a proclamation in your packet tonight that will be presented to Mr. Robert Brolt for the um, John E. and Ethel E. Riley Outstanding Citizen Award on Wednesday evening at the Ecumenical Service. Is there a motion to authorize the proclamation? Motion so. to authorize the proclamation. Is there Go ahead. For um, Robert. Yeah. Second. Second. Any discussion? I'll just say that Mr. Bro is well deserving. I said on the committee, and he uh, he's done so much for the community. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. We have it here tonight with us to be sure that we get signatures from all members. Thank you, Mr. Holstrom. And it should be 7.05 at this point. About 30 seconds. Okay. We have, let's see if there's anything else we can move up. In your packet, you have communications to the Massachusetts State Lottery Commission. Is there a motion to move up item 5A? I'll move. Second. Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. So this is, um, dear sir or madam, in accordance with the Mass General Laws, you are hereby notified that an existing Kino agent is requesting to move within the town from Dur Drury Quick Stop, Drury Square Quick Stop to Drury Square Quest. Square Quick Stop at 317 Southbridge Street. If the if the city objects to the outside move, it must claim its right to a hearing before the MSLC within 21 days of receipt of this letter. Please address your written objections to William Egan. Is there any objection of the board in the transfer of this no license? Objection. So the board will take no action on that. So being 705, we have a hearing for um, a telephone poll location and enclosed is your petition from Verizon New England and National Grid. Is there a motion to open the hearing? I move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. The hearing is open. Do we have representatives here tonight for the telephone poll relocation? If you could give your name and address for the record, please. Hi, Iris Price from National Grid. Okay. Uh, we have a customer on um, Oakwood Avenue that would like to have a pole relocated because they're putting in a new driveway. Okay. In order to do that, we're asking to put in two poles because the spans was too long. Okay. So, um, so are both poles on the same property, or is it on someone else's property? It will be in between um, two different properties. Okay. Yeah, I'll check. Um, are you, what happens to the old pole when you move the, the, the uh... We, uh, the old pole will be taken out by Verizon when all the companies are off the pole. Okay, and that happens within? A reasonable time frame. It doesn't sit there and till another crew comes and picks it up. What's the time frame for that? Uh, where Verizon will be removing the pole, but I'm not 100% sure. What would happen is um, National Grid would be the first one to get on the poles, mm -hmm. and then uh, Cable and Verizon. And once those two companies have transferred off the old pole, Verizon will pull out the old pole, but. Okay, thanks. Do any members have any questions for National Grid first? Mr. Simonian. Uh, I know this isn't the first time it's been done. Do you have a, a time frame for, you know, how long it usually takes before that pole is removed? Just to follow up on that. Previous. Again, this is Verizon set area. You would have to contact Verizon on a time frame. I can't answer for okay. Verizon. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other member questions? Are there any about us? Any about us who want to be heard? If you could come up to the microphone, please, and give your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is uh, Mike Doobie, 40 Oakwood Ave. I'll be involved in this uh, change of polls. Have no, uh, you know, no objections at all. Okay. Uh, just wondering when they might be starting this project. Is this, your, is this your property that the, um, is this your property? Yes. Okay. Um, we, we can't answer that right now until, until we get through the hearing and then ask them that question. They need approval no, from this no, board. No objections. Okay. No. Thank you. I'll clear with their diagram. Okay. Are there um, any other about us? So if you could come back up, we have an additional question, please, which would be if you get board approval tonight, what will be the time frame here of relocating these poles? Again, this is a Verizon set area. Um, once and if it's approved, Verizon will be setting the pole. Um, they would have to get on Verizon schedule. Okay. Is, and is there anyone here from Verizon? Okay, thank you. That's it. To yes, thank you. Do members have any questions or comments? Just 
Mr. Simone. Can we can we find out from Verizon what you know what they anticipate at least since it seems to be the one question that everyone has that can't get answered. I'm I'm sure I'm sure those folks would like to know how long they're going to be. Well, if the if the board votes to approve this tonight, I'd like to see a condition on the on the approval that this um, existing poll be removed within you know whatever we determine is reasonable, so that um, the poll isn't left there and forgotten. Because there, you know, I believe been a couple others that have just <coughs> been left, and we don't want that to happen. So, is there a motion on the application? Oh, um, I'm sorry. Is there a motion? Did, are um, we under discussion before we close the hearing, Mr. Sponia? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with the condition. <clears throat> but if even if we say that 60 days, they, they have 60 days to remove the poll, I, I guess my question would be how do, how do we enforce that? If they don't come and get it, we can't, it's not like we can put any sanctions on Verizon or anything like that. How, I, I agree that there should be some kind of um, way to at least guarantee if we can um, I'm just not sure how we could possibly do that well I, I would I would hope that with a company like Verizon if the if the board puts a condition on you know it's just in good faith that they oh, now helps. know that the board wants the poll removed that they would remove it uh, through the chair if I may there was a incident last week where it was reported to us that a poll had been abandoned and left there by Verizon, we contacted Verizon and they removed the poll within one day. Oh, so right. I think what we could do, uh, Mr. Simonian, is the town could keep our eye on it once That's the fine. construction starts and once it's completed. If the poll hasn't been removed, we can place another call to Verizon and they were responsive when we called last week. That's fair enough. Uh, they were, I believe it's my understanding, I, they were going to be here tonight, so I'm not sure what happened, but uh, we can certainly get in touch with them and let them know what the board's vote is when you do take that. Okay. Is there anything else? Is there a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close the hearing. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. The hearing is now closed. Is there a motion on the petition? Motion to um, approve the poll relocation and removal uh, with the condition. I, I guess I would say um, within 60 days after uh, after the, the polls have been Would you set. Would be agreeable to 30, just with going into the winter here? 30 is fine. If, okay. I mean, if, if you think, okay. I'll go with like 30. 30 works. Yeah, we're that. going into the winter here, so. Right. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, so voted. All set, thank you. The next item we have is National Grid, the Smart Grid Program. In your packet, you have some information that was sent to us before National Grid. Through the chair, if I might. Yep. I had a meeting uh, with National Grid uh, a few months ago, and Mr. William Jones is here to represent them and speak tonight. Ms. Alita Fazone is also here from National Grid, and both of them had uh, met with town officials a couple months ago to explain this program. We thought it would be appropriate to have them come in tonight and just give you a brief presentation on what the program is, how many Auburn uh, residents and customers it impacts, and what the intent of the program is and what questions you may have on it. If you could come up to the microphone, please, just give your name for the record. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Bill Jones with National Grid. Okay. Uh, yes, as Julie mentioned, we had come in and met uh, with Julie uh, to discuss a little bit about the uh, what's commonly referred to as the Worcester uh, Smart Grid pilot. Uh, we've uh, recently uh, renamed as the Smart Energy Solutions Program, okay? Uh, in particular, within your packet, I got a little information I'm going to walk through, but um, in general, uh, the, the pilot was something that was required because of the 2008 Green Communities Act. All the investor-owned utilities in the state were required to um, basically design and get approval to have uh, smart grid pilots. Uh, so National Grid Submittal was approved in uh, August of 2012 and was specifically located in, within most of the area of uh, Worcester. And I'll go through some of those specifics. Um, part of the goals of this whole program was really to um, basically pilot some of the uh, recent technologies as it related to um, smart meters, 
uh, advanced distribution automation, okay? Uh, also um, offering customers choices with regards to um, uh, various home technology options, uh, and then finally uh, introducing and, and testing some new rates uh, with an effort to sort of understand better how we might progress um, some further opportunities um, going forward with grid modernization, okay? So within your packet, you'll see uh, in general, uh, I'll start on my left there, uh, there's a smart uh, a fact sheet, okay? So the pilot itself was designed to have 15,000 uh, customers. The way we designed the pilot, because it is uh, uh, designed around our uh, energy system or our energy delivery, is we designed it around uh, various circuits that serve customers. So part, part of the, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you, could you just raise that oh, a I'm little sorry. bit? No. You're, you're welcome to come sit up, that microphone that seems be to be, you're welcome to come sit up here with your packet. This, we this may hear you a little better. have an echo when you're not speaking directly into the microphone. <laughs> no, that's not. No, no, it seems to be having a problem with the microphone I, tonight. <laughs> I just don't want to miss it, so oh, thanks. Great. Appreciate it. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. Is this one on? Yeah. yeah. Should be. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everyone hear me okay? Um, so it, the, the pilot was designed to include about 15,000 customers. Uh, we designed the pilot with our electric grid in mind. So for those that are familiar, our electric grid doesn't necessarily follow 100% of the town lines and certain streets and, and, and avenues and major routes, et cetera. So uh, when we designed this pilot, uh, we did design it around the circuits. In particular, one of the circuits that we're using for the pilot actually has what we consider some borderline customers um, that are just on the, um, uh, I believe it's the uh, northeast section there, uh, bordering uh, Worcester and Auburn. So, um, and I'll, I'll give you a little more uh, specifics on that later on, okay? So, um, the, you know, this whole program, though, has been underway since uh, last August. Uh, we've really uh, generated, or, or at least um, um, a lot of the um, ideas and premises behind it were, were developed through a, a major uh, green to growth uh, summit that was held in Worcester a couple years back, okay? And a lot of folks from uh, stakeholders from across many areas uh, joined us and discussed, you know, what a, you know, greener, more sustainable future would look like, which basically informed the whole program, okay? You'll see on the sheet, on the fact sheet there, as we go down below, there's information about the various features and benefits. Um, and, um, you know, as of right now, we have just, just over 14,000 meters that are actually out there. We've started to install um, some of our uh, advanced uh, distribution automation devices out there. Um, about back in uh, late October, or middle October, October 18th, we had, uh, we opened a sustainability hub, and you'll see on the right hand of your packet there, there's a lot of details, there's the press release and some information about that. Uh, we're really quite pleased with how that came out. That was a partnership working with Clark University, and it's a place for anyone, all right? It's not just about folks within the Smart Energy Solutions uh, program, pilot area, but any of our customers, which we include obviously Auburn or, or uh, anyone to actually go and, and understand a little bit more about all the various opportunities within sustainability. There's, you know, obviously information about um, Smart Grid, but there's also a lot of um, information about some of the uh, sustainable solutions with regard to energy efficiency, um, construction, all that, um, all those other items, okay? The uh, I'll just flip over. Um, so again, part of this is really about encouraging uh, customers to, to have choices, okay? So uh, part of the program, it, it's an opt-out pilot. So what we do, and there's an example in there, is we, there's a letter that we send to customers uh, that just basically introduces them to the uh, pilot program. Yep, it's, that's a sample letter that went out to customers, okay? Describes a little bit about the program. Oh, I'm sorry. And you'll see here that this letter here goes to customers that have that are within the pilot area that basically introduces them to the pilot and provides them some information and also provides them information on how they can contact us to get more information and or if they choose to opt out they can opt out okay which means that um, if they don't want the smart meter they don't have to uh, have one installed in fact um, 
it's, it's, there is no charge, okay? So I do want to make that clear because there's been a lot of confusion about, um, you know, if, if they don't take, take these new meters, is there a charge? There is no charge. This is a pilot, and that was part of the um, agreement when we built, uh, developed this pilot. So you'll see here, um, part of what we're going to introduce to these customers is along with the smart meter, we'll also give them some tools that will be able to uh, introduce them to their energy usage. So today you're very familiar with your energy bill, and it's basically the one-month summary for the past month. Well, uh, the new meters will provide uh, customers in the pilot area with the ability to see their 15-minute usage patterns so they can start to understand, you know, how they're using their energy uh, throughout the day, throughout a week, uh, et cetera, and in a more real-time uh, basis. In addition, um, we'll be introducing new pricing options that will be offered out to, to, to these customers to help them, um, un one, for us to understand what kind of rate plans resonate with customers and also to allow them to um, be able to save money um, and, and um, also save energy, okay? Um, uh, the last two I'll just quickly walk through, uh, just because I know my time is limited, is this particular document here. So. This just provides you a brief summary. The first one gives you a sense as to the areas in which the pilot um, has been identified. So there are bubbles that kind of give you a general sense as to where our meters are being deployed. And as I mentioned, it's not that far into uh, Auburn because this is just sort of a, a bubble chart. But in general, the next map I'll show you gives you the specifics on that, okay? Um, so these are the general locations where we have um, chosen about 15,000 customers. Uh, the next page just describes a little bit about smart meters. Um, and again, uh, we're using you know, technology that's readily available out there. This is, even though it's a pilot, we're, we're by no means the first ones to actually introduce these types of meters. In fact, there's many millions of them already in, um, installed and in use across the U.S. today. Okay. Um, on the third page, I just, I, I just try to uh, give you a quick summary that uh, customers that are within the pilot area will have uh, technology choices. Again, no charge, okay? So um, each of these um, components, uh, there is no charge to the uh, customers that are actually selected. Um, they'll get a, um, they'll have an option to, well, first off, everyone will get, get access to the internet to their energy usage. And then there's some um, special packages if customers are interested that provide a uh, window frame that allows them to kind of see information about how their energy usage is. Um, and also provides uh, a tool that allows them to, you know, use it for other purposes such as displaying pictures, et cetera. And then we also have program, uh, program, programmable uh, thermostats that are also available to uh, customers that are selected for those particular uh, technology packages. And then the last page just speaks to uh, the fact that um, 2014 will be offering various pricing options to those customers that are part of the pilot. Um, the last document I'll just point out to you, uh, I actually tried to give you a better view of approximately where in, in Auburn. Um, there's, there was a total of uh, under 100 customers in total, uh, and they're located up in that section on the um, uh, probably more, more like the northeast side of um, uh, Pakichog uh, golf course there. Uh, and you can see you got a few streets that kind of run right along the border there. Um, and uh, there's one little neighborhood there where that circuit I talked about actually is served by um, many of the pilot customers. So, um, so much of what we've, sh we've shared here, those customers have been um, you know, are available, you know, are eligible for and, and have been communicated to um, and obviously have the uh, right to opt out as well. Is there anything more I can? Let me just, uh, Mr. Hallstrom. I yes. We have a question, a few questions. Uh, through the chair, uh, have you realized any benefits now through this new program and what would they be? So at this point, um, we're still in the process of rolling it out. So we have our, our meters uh, that we get out there first. We're, like I mentioned, we're just starting to uh, construct the uh, grid devices. But some of the uh, benefits that we're looking for all right, include, we're really trying to uh, measure and um, test that consumers or customers 
are able to uh, achieve a 5% or greater reduction in their energy use. Okay, so that's one of the, the uh, key items there. The second part uh, is around the whole um, uh, reliability and performance of these circuits that we're uh, including in the pilot areas. We're testing some advanced uh, distribution automation devices as well as adding monitors and, and other components, fault indicators that, that were, um, uh, once they're uh, fully enabled, we're, we're hoping we'll be able to highlight where there are outages or other issues um, within that circuit so that we can you know, be quicker to respond. And in some cases, some of these uh, advanced distribution automation components that we're testing, uh, I, I'll use the term, they tend to, uh, they, they'll be configured to self-heal, so they'll automatically adjust themselves until, and try to isolate the situation or, or the problem prior to us actually getting out there so that um, today what we do is we go out, we find the issue, and then we begin to isolate and, and switch to um, then begin repairs. Uh, so that's another benefit that we're looking for. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no. Oh. Um, and then the, um, the, you know, the last one is really just trying to get a sense from customers, you know, what, what are the types of products and services that you see as, um, you know, be, being an expectation that you have from a utility going forward, okay? So like I mentioned, we're, we're offering up some technology options. Is, te is home technology a tool that you'll use to better manage your energy use? Uh, we're offering pricing plans because in some cases uh, we're trying to find out, you know, do con consumers see the pricing plans as a way in which that they can, you know, better uh, impact how much they spend on energy and, and, and obviously um, encourage them to use uh, energy at cheaper times during the day. Mr. Grossman. Did you mention in, in your talking before about the access of making changes in the course of the day, perhaps by way of use, I think you said internet or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, would there be an app on a telephone that would the customer would be able to access? And what is the security protection that the customer would have? And someone getting in on their uh, information. Sure, um, excellent question. So there are, there are three elements that I, I think is important to address as you just described. So the first is um, all around, um, we'll call it the whole privacy issue, right? So um, in essence, uh, you know, privacy is one of the, the key areas that we're focused on. So when we offer up these tools and capabilities, we're looking at all the security standards, um, the, um, you know, ability to um, monitor and manage, um, you know, the fact that people are only the correct people are, are getting access to, to their data alone. Um, it's, uh, it's also something that, you know, as, as a company we take very seriously. We can't share this data uh, by, in, by any stretch, um, and we take our privacy, the, you know, customer's privacy very seriously. I mean, we've been doing it for, uh, you know, quite a few many years here. Um, but the game has changed a bit, as you highlighted, because now we're, we're moving into a, a realm of, you know, um, you know, technology, smartphones, internet, et cetera. Um, and um, so, you know, privacy, obviously safety, so we do pay attention to all the concerns. You know, everyone um, um, has various points of view when it comes to safety, et cetera, but uh, we, we do do our best to, to um, do our due diligence with regards to that. We're only using commercially available technologies. We ensure that they meet all, all the uh, relevant standards um, as they exist and, um, you know, items like that. Did you have something, Mrs. Spooning? Yeah. Um, so, part of kind of along the same lines. Um, when when you I was reading here and it says you're going to leverage wireless communications. So if I if I'm using a smartphone, I to control the environment remotely. Is that what you're talking about? Um, so that's one way. So um, in some cases, you have um, smartphones that will be able to. Um, adjust your thermostats remotely. Right. I mean, th those technologies are actually available today, even no, without I know. this program. But yeah, th those types of capabilities will be made available. But as far as the data transfer, is it is it actually data that the smart meter collects and sends back to National Grid? Yeah. So, just just to be clear, the smart meter itself has no customer data on it. It's basically right. just keeping track of the periodic um, usage. So it's we call it 15-minute interval data. And ultimately what it's doing is it's just sending us 
you know, tied to that meter ID, we'll call it, right, the actual usage stuff and behind the scenes it comes into our, um, you know, um, uh, offices through that mechanism securely and then we ultimately marry it up to you as a customer and then render it on your customer uh, records. Is that, a, is that a private network that National Grid has? Uh, so yes, what we're, what we're doing through this pilot is building a private network in order to further ensure that, yes. Okay, so, so any existing Wi-Fi that a person has in their home is not tied into this? No, no, you can, there are, there are ability to tie in your internal Wi-Fi for some of the home technology items here, yes. Right, but not as far as that, what the meter accesses or anything else, it's totally separate, right? You, you, you have a virtual private network of some sort that is the data from the, the smart meter has, and then if someone's going to monitor the usage or whatever through, that, that's going to be done on their end on the Wi-Fi. Correct. So it's two separate things. All right. Thanks. Yeah, we're not doing the shared oh, no. network Thanks. piece okay. where, where we're sharing the same thing, correct? Yeah. Thank you. So I just have a question on notification. Yes, you said that, um, that everyone has been notified. Did you send this letter out or yeah, was a, it a one mailing it, yes. or have they um, had follow-up? Have you been, are you aware of any contact by residents with questions or concerns? You, you know, I'm not. I'm just aware of, um, you know, the uh, number of uh, customers that were eligible. Okay. And, and they were all notified at least once by letter? Yeah, letter. Okay. We have postcards and, um, and other elements. I have postcards here that we also send out, which are just, you know, Great. smaller versions of those. Um, and we do have uh, normal communications that we send out to folks. Uh, through uh, newsletters and other things. So if anyone were to be watching this tonight and they had questions, they can go on nationalgrid.com um, right. forward slash smart energy or use that 855 number? That's correct. Great, thank if you. you. Want, yeah, we can say that. 1-855-377-7627. Yeah. 855-377-SMART. Any more questions? Good. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing that information. all over so we had the telephone poll national grid we did communications we're in the board of selectmen items we have a common victuals license for jack's variety at 317 southbridge street enclosed are the application documents and comments from the dcg concerning the application is there someone here for the license if you could come up <laughs> good evening yeah just hold on one sec till we just Clear the hall so we can hear you. <laughs> Great, thanks. If you could give your name and address for you, the record and just tell us a little bit about why you're here tonight. I'm Jack Armstrong, 7 Heritage Lane, West Boylston, Mass. I'm just here to uh, see if common. The, uh, could you also move the microphone closer? Thank you. Thanks. How's that? That's better. Thank okay. you. Um, just uh, moving my store from the BP station up to 317, so it's two doors up. Okay. okay. And everyone's familiar with the location? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. the former House of Wheels location. Right, right. And so you met with the DCG, and are you familiar with the conditions that they have recommended be on your, your license? Yes. that the applicant shall obtain all necessary permits from the Board of Health uh, and all final inspections be after all final inspections are completed and that the applicant shall obtain all necessary building permits including but not limited to a certificate of occupancy um, inspection yep. do members have any questions or comments mr. Smonian just one um, same one I asked, uh, you were, said you're aware of the conditions. I just want to make sure that you're also aware that this board, as the licensing authority, is the only entity that can allow you to change, make any changes to your license. I just want to make sure you understand that. There's no one else that can tell you to alter the license in any way. It, it's, it's come up, so as a standard question, I, I ask that of everyone. What, what change? There's, any change in your operation? Like any change at all, as far as the way the license is granted tonight, if it's granted. 
cannot be changed unless you come back to this board to make it. Okay, yeah, okay, no problem. All right, just want to make sure you're aware of that. Thank you. I understand. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, is there any? I don't just want to, um, are there time, like, um, I am going to be changing the store hours from, instead of opening at 7, I'm going to open at 8. That's, I don't. Or instead, excuse me, instead of 6, I'm going to open at 7. And that's a, okay. Right, but on your application you ha ha have before us, we have Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and Sunday, 8 to 5. Oh, okay, I put it on there, okay. Yeah. I used to open at 6. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a little too early for me. Okay. Is there any public comment? Is there a motion on the application? Motion to approve the license to provide all applicable requirements of the state and town and if its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all the conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with the conditions of the DCG. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thank you. Good luck in your new location. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we did drain layers license, we've done acceptance, we've done the proclamation. Under Board of Selectmen items, we have member items. The first item is Camp Gleason by Mr. Simonian. I just, just a couple of questions, and, and this is, of the, of the two, this is the only one that I'm actually going to address, but I'm going to hold the next one, item number two for the next meeting. Um, so, at town meeting, we had, we had had a discussion uh, here under the board to, um, grant the opportunity or the ability to lease Camp Gleason and then it was postponed indefinitely at town meeting and I so my first question was I I didn't I didn't know why that happened um so I, I just wanted to find out what what the reason was and how that affects us going forward based on what you know the discussion we had did you want to ask both questions or just I'll just start ask that, that one okay through the chair to the town okay meeting. Uh, certainly the as we had come to the Board of Selectmen to ask for uh, your approval to put an item on the warrant that would allow us to lease the property for up to a period of 20 years with the town maintaining full control of it uh, the afternoon before town meeting uh, I had a meeting with a gentleman who happened to be on a committee that was put together back in the 60s and he had um, an uh, in the interim, I had also heard from the clerk that there was an additional vote that was taken at town meeting that would potentially, um, it would potentially put the control of Camp Gleason under the Conservation Commission. And I want to explain why. Um, we went through, I, this is pretty much part of the file here, but these are all the deeds that we went through in our research on Camp Gleason. And uh, it, it's really, it's an interesting history, but between 1917 and up all the way up to 1960, there were some 31 parcels of land that were deeded over from private residents to American Steel and Wire Corporation, which later became U.S. Steel. So a number of different names, but originally American Steel. And at that time, American Steel leased it, uh, later U.S. Steel leased it from 60 to 65 to uh, the South Works Athletic Association for use for recreation. Um, in, in 1967, May 4, 1967, town meeting voted to accept the deed from U.S. Steel Corp, and it was approved. And there was a motion that was made on the floor at that town meeting in 67 to give the control of the parcel to the Conservation Commission, part of it to the Conservation Commission, I believe the north of Route 20 or south of Route 20, and the, uh, the opposite, the north or south of Route 20, to the Parks Commission. That vote was defeated at town meeting. That was the last um, information we had. Then we saw there was, an, uh, we have a May 16th, 1967 agreement of sale, and then we had a July, uh, excuse me, a May 3rd, 1968, so a year later, we actually have the transfer of land and all the deeds to the town of Auburn. And in those deeds, there is no mention in there of anything related to Conservation Commission. Uh, the day before town meeting, the clerk's office had spoken to the same gentleman that I spoke to and said that actually there had been a, what appears to be a special town meeting uh, in July, July 24th of 1967, so following the original vote. And at that meeting, there were three votes that were taken on the Camp Gleason property. And again, it was proposed to give a portion of it to the Parks Commission and that was rejected. 
So the vote was ultimately taken after the third time, there was a vote taken to, tr to give control, and that's the word they use, not care, custody, and control like we use now, but control to the Conservation Commission. And that was in 67. But the deed in 68 and everything that we found after that does not have any indication that that was ever filed, registered, or put on the deed. So the question, <coughs> given that there, were, there was a question, we felt it was better to pull it off of the town meeting warrant because if Conservation Commission does have control of the property or has had control of the property for 50 years, number one, I'm not sure that they ever knew they did because after a certain point because I don't think it was ever registered. And number two, if they did have it, then we would likely need to have a vote of Conservation Commission, and we want to have a vote of Conservation Commission in support of the fact that we would like to lease the property. It wouldn't remove the property. Our, our vote initially to lease it, and if we were to go back to the town meeting, which we hope to do, would never, we're not asking to sell the land. We believe it's an asset that we should retain and preserve. Um, but we think we need to do a little bit more legal research to see if Conservation Commission would have to co-sponsor the article. If the amended charter in uh, May of 2009 uh, preempts what was done in 1967, in which case the control of the parcel goes to the town manager, in which case the original motion that we're, uh, the original warrant article and the language that we put in would, would stand, or if it has to be amended to include Conservation Commission. So that's the long story. There's, there's a little bit too much of a question to bring it forth. That's fine. Um, I contacted town council the, the, that afternoon, and we both agree that it's best to just go through and do all the research, make sure we're, it's been thoroughly researched. Um, but it, it's a very interesting history, and you know it's, it's a good lesson in what's gone on in, in the town in a number of years to see this. Some residents had actually come to me early on and said, you know, that was given to the town with restrictions for certain use, and we cannot find any restrictions in any of these deeds, including the Conservation Commission restriction. So we're going to continue to look at it, but uh, what we are proposing, just so everyone knows, we did not pull it off because we intend to sell it. You no, know, no. There was a concern that that might be what we were doing. That's not the case. We're still looking potentially for a long-term lease with the benefit being that if there were leasehold improvements to the building, it would preserve the building, uh, maintain it for us for the future, and give the town access to the property when we need it. Um, also through the chair, um, now if we eventually do lease that property, uh, and I, I, had a, I, I did have a brief conversation with, um, with uh, Mr. Anton Vicka, on just on the property in general, but would we, I guess, as lack of a better term, it, would we as landlord, like, it would still be our property. So, what liability do we still have to for someone who leases that property and is on it? Because I know that during the whole the initial discussion, we we had a conversation. You know, there's, <laughs> there's repairs or and mm -hmm. other things um, that need to be done to the property. So how much of that? How much of that is the town? Would the town be responsible for? Is there anything that we have to do to lease it? Do we know? Um, do we have a general idea what the cost to you know to do any? I mean, renovations or if there's code issues or anything. Do we know any of that? And and I guess I'll just ask the final question because I had a conversation with uh, Mr. Coyle probably close to a year ago when we first had the discussion about the Route 20 project starting, and he said that. Um, I think it was more than a possibility that the state was going to redo the culvert that started the initial mess over there in the first place um, and change the flow, I guess, uh, around the beach area. I don't know if that was still going to happen. So <laughs> I know it's a lot of questions, but that pretty much encompasses all of it. Okay, let me take let me take a uh, shot at answering. I'll go with your last one first. Right. Uh, the, it's my understanding uh, from Bill Coyle that the state has not made this a priority as far as redoing the culvert. That would be about a million dollar project. What they did instead uh, a, a couple of years ago is they went in and they did some cleanup to the property. But it's still it's not enough to change the water flow or lack of water flow, which is causing some of the sediment, which causes some of the environmental issues. So that's uh, last we were told the state was not going to replace it at this time because okay. of the cost of a million dollars. Um, the second part is, as the building stands now, for what the town is using it for, which is an occasional, an occasional use, we use the lower level for our DPW facility management to keep some of their equipment and do some of their projects in there. Uh, we're within code for the current use. If we would put it out to bid, 
we would do a couple of things. Number one, we would require that the tenant make any leasehold improvements that were required to bring the building to within whatever code requirements would be for that use. So the use of the building will dictate what the code requirements are. Okay. And that would become the responsibility of the tenant, not of the town. Uh, number two, we would be seeking a tenant that would put significant leasehold improvements into the property so that we could maintain the facility and preserve it and also insist that the tenant maintained the building while they were uh, in charge of it as a tenant. Again, no cost to the town to do that. Uh, number three, our liability from an insurance standpoint, we would require that the tenant had a certain level of insurance. Um, we, we're not, we've put out a couple of calls to our, a uh, couple of conversations to our insurance agent just to see what that liability requirement would be for the tenant, but obviously we would have to be indemnified for any liability and there would have to be a certain level of coverage on the property, say it's $2 million or $3 million, whatever our insurance agent recommends, that would be a requirement of the RFP. So again, that would not fall on the town okay. to have that uh, liability. So we would make sure we had all that in place. We didn't go any further on the details of the RFP because we felt if the town meeting for any reason decided that they didn't want us to do this and we weren't going to expend any funds on a legal end of, of doing the extensive research and the extensive preparation of an RFP. If they do vote it, then we'll take the next couple of months, work with town council, and make sure we get all the criteria in the RFP that protects the town. All right, this, this is the last question. I, this is, I hate to play the what if game, I'm, I'm, but if, if we don't, if, if town meeting does shoot this down when it eventually goes back on, what, what are our options? Because I just look at, you know, I bike right up there sometimes just looking at the building from the outside you know there's some obviously some things that need to be done or do we have you know have we given some thought as to like us renovating it if we if we need to if we get to that point if town meeting doesn't approve of a lease as agreement? it stands right now there are there are no uh leasehold improvements that are required to be in be done to the building right now for its current use. Uh, our concern is more with having an underutilized facility that's fairly secluded, that could be subject to vandalism, um, a crime in the area. Uh, it's a deterrent. Uh, having a tenant in there, even on a temporary basis, is a deterrent to crime. Mm -hmm. So as the physical part of the building stands now, we don't need to make any improvements to it. If something were to go in a couple of years, if the roof starts to leak, if we have some um, HVAC issues or any, anything like that with the building, it's the town's responsibility to repair it, and we would have to do that. We would have to put it on a capital improvement project list and go to town meeting for funding to maintain that building. So we were thinking long term, rather than in the future knowing in the next few years there's going to be some repairs that are probably going to be needed to that building, could we try to find a tenant now who's willing to make those type of repairs and maintain the building on our behalf instead of us having to make that kind of capital investment. If town meeting were to turn it down, plan B would be for us to look at it, um, start working with DPW, identifying what issues need to be done just like we do with any town building and scheduling out the repairs that are going to be needed to that building to maintain it. Uh, again, another concern will be fire. We want to make sure that it's, you know, there's there's no public safety issue there. So we would have to look at all of those types of repairs. We do not have a cost of that right now. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that point, but we would have to do that. All right, thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you. And the next item is also Mr. Simone in support of Slickman policies. I, I'm, I'm going to skip that one tonight. Uh, Mr. Hallstrom. I brought my book of policies with me tonight. I wasn't sure what we were going to be discussing, so I brought them all with me. I know we have a couple that are in the subcommittee and being worked on, so I guess through the chair I'm asking what policies that uh, you know want to be discussed so we have some information for our next meeting. Um, I don't, that's, that's why I'm not, I don't have anything specific right now I, that I wanted. So I, that's why I'm not speaking to it. So I guess the question would be is if you, if we address it at the next meeting, sure. would you be more specific for Mr. Holstrom as to what sure. policies will be addressed? Thank you. Thank you. Nothing else on that. We have town manager items. The first one is the fiscal year 14 regional community innovation challenge grant. 
Uh, thank you. Through the chair, I'd like to have uh, Bill Waterman speak to this. He is our uh, information technology director, and he's very familiar with this. But just before he speaks, just this would be, uh, I believe, the third regional CIC grant that we've come to the board for this year. Again, these are state grants; they're made available to <coughs> regions uh, that are looking to do something innovative and beneficial to the to a, a broader group than just one municipality. So, Bill had come to me uh, the other day with a request from the town of Lowell for participation in this grant, and it sounded like a great opportunity. So, Bill, if you want to just explain it. Hello, what, uh, what we're looking for tonight is just to get a signature on this application. It, there's no obligation at all. Um, you know, by the town, there's no financial obligation associated with this. This is just a preliminary document that says the town of Auburn is interested in this project. So there's, uh, there's no, you know, like I say, no financial obligation. Uh, this project was, is being spearheaded by the city of Lowell. It's in conjunction with the town of Andover. And w what it, the plan is, is to replace uh, the state, what's called listserv. There is a, essentially an email address out there that's been there since October of 2003. And what that does is IT people throughout the state, if they have a question that they want to ask fellow IT people, they'll send an email to this address and then everybody that's on this list will get, will get the email. And so then they can respond to it. The problem with that is it's, it's somewhat inefficient, it's somewhat limited, uh, and it's, it's kind of getting old. So uh, the plan here and the, the grant would be to replace that with a web portal. Uh, they're looking for a fairly sizable amount of money, $423,000. But what, that, what that's going to do is it's going to create this web portal that will benefit all cities and towns, I mean, all cities and towns, IT people initially, and then ultimately it may be expanded if it's successful, which I think it will be, to include assessors, clerks. So you can ask this thing, uh, you know, you basically you're collaborating with your peers amongst the 351, well, uh, not so many, a lot of towns don't have IT, but uh, a fairly sizable amount of towns throughout the state. So far, Amherst, Andover, Belmont, Brookline, Cambridge, Canton, Lowell, Newton, and Pittsfield have signed up. And uh, going through the process that we're going through tonight is Belreca, Chelsea, East Longmeadow, Fall River, Hingham, Lawrence, Linfield, Methuen, New Bedford, North Reading, Springfield, Taunton, and Williamstown. So there's a lot of towns that have already expressed interest. And like I say, um, it's just a form that gets signed. It, it'll go back to the IT, uh, actually the CIO of the city of Lowell, and it'll be included in this uh, grant application, which is uh, a 16-page document that details exactly what this grant uh, involves it, it gets right down to uh, the allocation of the money and um, what the benefits are going to be it just seems like it's a really a big step you know a move forward from what we have now okay are there any questions mr. Smolian um, when, you, when you say when you say portal or would this be some would this be something that people would come into prior to coming to the Auburn site? Is, is um, this would actually be separate. Um, you will have a separate f uh, login, but it will only be for people who register and that are IT initially, there'll be IT departments throughout the state. It does have uh, support from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts so it's it's going to be it will it will be separate from the ta the town of Auburn website. Okay, so there's no there's no change to our infrastructure, nor any change to the end user coming in to not if, at all. If they want to look at anything. No. Okay. 
This Thank will you. actually Perfect. be running on servers up at the city of Lowell. They're going to build the whole thing. So it, it would benefit us? It'll benefit us because we'll have access to it. And, and what, would we, what would we use from this set of servers? Is well, I'll, I'll give you an example. We, um, we, just did a, we just did a new phone system in the town of Auburn. Okay. And, that, and, and there was a, a lot of research involved with that. One thing I could have done there is, is uh, uh, the listserv is somewhat limited, but with this thing, there's going to be essentially knowledge bases and things like that. And okay. you can say, okay, uh, let's say the city of Newton just did a, a system just like we have. You know, I can, I can find that information out. There's going to be archives. I can query it. Uh, there's just an example of, of so many things like that, the, the okay. information you can get out of there. I, I got it. That's, that's fine. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? Is there a motion? We'll make a motion. We uh, uh, approve the application and go forward with this. Second. Do you have the phone? And that's the Regional Community yes. Innovation Challenge Grant. Is that what that is? CIC. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. CIC. And that's the filing and participation and acceptance of funds? Yes. And there's a second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed to voting? Who, who needs to sign? And when you're done, you can just sign right there as the chair. Of the okay. They just need one signature. Thank okay, you. Okay, and the entity on that is Town of Auburn. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. While the chair is signing that, I could go to the next item, which is a grant as well. Um, the this is uh, a request for the board to authorize us to apply for, accept, and expend uh, uh, grant funds again under, this is for just the town of Auburn alone, under the FY14 U.S. Um, DOT Hazardous Materials Emergency Preparedness Planning Grant, which is an HMEP grant. We received one last year in the amount of $1,135, and again this year that's the amount that's available to us. These grants have to be used to fund either training or equipment directly related to uh, hazardous material and transportation of hazardous, hazardous material planning. So we would be seeking to get two iPads for the use of the emergency management team for tracking of, of hazardous materials for planning purposes. Uh, can be used for other things as well, but that has to be the primary purpose it, within planning for LEMPC. And again, the amount is $1,135. Any questions or comments? No, I make okay. a motion. We uh, authorize the applying for, accepting, and expending the grant funds for the U.S. DOT Hazardous Materials Emergency Preparedness uh, Planning Grant. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. <clears throat> the next item we have is a request to declare surplus property. And Chief Coleman. Good evening. Uh, did you want me to read the letter or were you going to? Um, sure. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm here this evening um, asking the board to declare uh, some hose that's used by the fire rescue department as surplus uh, property. Uh, much of this hose that I'm looking uh, to dispose of uh, has been considered spare hose in the department for many years. It's been in our Connex uh, trailer. Uh, so in an effort to try to clean that out, we're looking for the uh, disposal. Uh, some of the National Fire Protection Association, the NFPA requirements, uh, hose is no, has no uh, useful life after 20 years. Much of this hose is coming up on that 20 year. Uh, all of this hose that is being disposed of has been replaced within the last several years through the CIP. Um, so again, much of this hose is already broken or not usable. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you, Chief. Is there a motion? Motion to approve the request to declare the property as surplus. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So voted. And the next one is also the um, assistance to firefighters grant. Yes, thank you. Thank you, you Chief. Uh, I'm here this evening uh, looking for the board to support uh, our submitting of the assistance to firefighter grant or the AFG grant. Um, I'm asking for your support. Uh, to apply for the grant, uh, hopefully if the funds are received, and then to expend. 
Uh, we are seeking to replace our 38 self-contained breathing apparatus, our SCBA, those are the air tanks that we wear on our back. Uh, it is the most vital piece of safety equipment that firefighters wear. Uh, the majority of the uh, current air packs that we have uh, were purchased in 1997. Uh, so there's, those are, um, they're actually just over uh, the 15 years. They were on the CIP for last year. I applied for this AFG grant last year as well uh, and actually pulled it off of the CIP hoping that we were going to get that grant. Uh, it's actually on the CIP for 2016, but again, we're, we're hoping to, to receive the grant this year, and if we do, we'd be able to pull it off the CIP. Um, the SCB, the bottles themselves have a useful life of 15 years. Uh, last year, uh, I ended up having to uh, purchase some used bottles uh, from the city of Worcester that had about five or six years of useful life on them, uh, just to kind of get us through. Um, in 2007, we received a grant uh, from the Fireman's Fund that purchased seven SCBA units. So those, out of the 38 we have, we have seven that are what's considered a newer uh, generation uh, with NFPA compliant over 2005. So the total grant amount that we are uh, going to be requesting for is for $344,296.50. And uh, if we were to receive those funds, it would replace the 38 SCBAs with spare bottles, the face pieces, and it would also replace uh, the compressor that we have at fire headquarters to fill those bottles. The current compressor that we have uh, is pushing 30 years old, uh, so this would uh, give us a, a brand new compressor uh, that would be able to fill these new bottles. So one of the problems that we currently have, again, with the SCBA is we're, we're two generations behind in, turn of, in terms of NFPA compliancy. So the majority of the packs that we have, they don't have um, many of the safety features that the new SCBAs have in terms of their head, heads up display, the rapid intervention, buddy breathing connections, many of those things. So we're very, very hopeful uh, that, that we're going to receive this grant. Uh, I'll certainly answer any questions, but I'm hoping to have the board support to apply. Are there any questions or comments? Is there a motion? Thank you, Chief. Motion to authorize the filing of the grant application and acceptance if granted. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thanks. Thank you very much. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Next item we have is a manager item, tree lighting and craft fair. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair and if I may just m make a comment I just want to thank the chief and all of the department heads uh, they've really done a tremendous job the last couple of years of seeking out and applying for grants uh, and uh, we put a slide up at town meeting recently just to show you but we've applied for probably at this point over 50 grants and we're just going to keep applying for them and hope we keep doing it uh, being successful on the town side alone we're approaching about four hundred thousand dollars worth of grants that we've received and you know, it's, it's all of our goal to continue to identify those grants and apply for them wherever we can. Where we can't do it on our own, we're joining with regional groups to try to do, uh, participate in regional initiatives. And we've applied for, well, at this point, it would probably be six regional grants. So I just want to thank everyone because they've really done a great job at doing this. We track them all. We have a spreadsheet. We show how many are outstanding, what the dollar amounts are, where they stand, and who's responsible. And it's been a good system. Thank you. I uh, just want to let everyone know that I said it uh, at the last meeting, but I wanted to remind everyone again, we do have our second annual tree lighting on Friday, December 6th at 6 p.m. at uh, right beside the fire station. And again, I want to thank Stearns Electric. They did come out uh, through the donation that the board accepted at the last meeting. They came out and they strung all the lights on the tree and it, it's going to be beautiful. And we have the Auburn Community Chorus, the Auburn High School Band, and Cookies from Bay Path, and of course Santa, and rumor has it he is bringing his elf again this year. So it should be a great family event. Uh, we're also working with Auburn Mall, which I didn't mention last time, but Auburn Mall has reached out to us and they would like to work with us to make the event a success. So we're working with them on having overflow parking at the mall, and they've been wonderful in letting us do that, particularly given that it's their busy season. So it's been great to work with them. Uh, and again, just a reminder, we also have our first craft fair Saturday, uh, December 14th at Auburn High School. So that's it. Thank you. And what time is the craft fair? All the fair? details are on our website. Okay. I believe it's at, uh, I believe it starts at 9 o'clock, but it could be 10. Okay. I apologize. I don't recall the time. It's okay. Thank you. Do you have anything else? 
Excellent. We have no tabled items. Is there any public comment? Mr. Smonian and then yeah, Mr. Um, Grossman. Not necessarily public comment. I was actually I was going to bring this up under member items, and I wish I had remembered because Mr. Waterman still would have been here. But um, just one thing, um, I was hoping that you know the board would kind of support this. I know it's off the cuff, but uh, just uh, most most companies do it, and um, through our town accounts, town email, um, some sort like a quarterly reminder to remind people of the dangers of opening. Um, email from people that they don't recognize or attachments they don't recognize and and the reason that I, I brought this up um, there's one out there right now that is just devastating um, businesses um, I haven't heard of it in the municipal area but personal um, it, it is basically if you open the attachment it goes into your computer locks up all your files encrypts them and you're held ransom if you don't pay the ransom it destroys the encryption key and you lose everything um, so not to put Mr. Waterman on the spot, but I was just thinking, you know, if we had that type of thing even once a quarter just to remind people not to, you know, open email, you don't know who it's from, attachments that you're not sure of, because some of these are actually coming out looking like regular Microsoft um, emails, mm -hmm. and people are just getting devastated by this. So I, I just thought I'd bring that up. And the second one is tomorrow night, um, the football team's last game of the season, though we don't have the traditional um, Thanksgiving Day game. There is a game scheduled for tomorrow night, I believe, against Wakefield. Um, so it'll be the last game of the season. Just want, and some, I guess, folks didn't seem to know about that one since the Thanksgiving Day one with Oxford kind of went by the wayside. Um, but there is one tomorrow, and uh, one out. Thank you, Mr. Grossman. I just wanted to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, the weather is going to be. Somewhat rough, although warm, uh, from tomorrow night through through Wednesday all day, they, they're expecting anywhere from two to four inches of rain. So anyone that's traveling, be careful and have a good holiday. I will echo that. Everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Chief, did you have something? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in line with what Mr. Grossman said regarding weather, I would just like to uh, remind everyone as we come into the winter season, I'd like to encourage everybody to take advantage of the technology that the town has made uh, available to the public in terms of uh, websites, whether it's the town's website, the fire department website, uh, Facebook pages from the, from the town. The fire department has a Facebook and Twitter account. Emergency management has a Facebook and Twitter account. And there's a lot of good information that goes up on, on those pages, not only for emergency preparedness, but when storms or other types of disasters hit. I can tell you that from the fire rescue department, we've been, we've been uh, doing some experimenting over the last couple months. We've made some great strides in the activity of our Facebook and Twitter page. Uh, we've been posting when there's power outages. We've been trying to provide the public with updates in as we get them from National Grid in terms of potential restoration uh, times of power. Uh, we have uh, 1610, uh, AM radio 1610 that's available. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, tremendous resources that are available to the community. I just want to make sure that, that people know that they exist. Um, like I said, we're trying to put as much information as we can, uh, not only, again, about preparedness, but about the actual event. Uh, the fire department, uh, Facebook and Twitter, you can find us at Auburn Mass Fire both on Facebook and Twitter, and Auburn Emergency Management as well on their uh, Facebook and Twitter. And then it's uh, Town of Auburn. Um, correct, Julie, Facebook page for the town is Town of Auburn? Uh, to get to our Facebook page, yes, Town of Auburn. And you can also click on the icon on our homepage, which is auburnguide.com. And right on there, you can click on the icon for Facebook. Um, and also, it's a great opportunity to follow up on the chief to remind people to sign up for Code Red, uh, which you can also do right through our website or call our office, and we can help you do that. We continue to monitor it and check and add new names, but you know, people's phone numbers change, their cell phones change, they get uh, different addresses even within town. So it's really important to keep that up going into this winter season. It's really critical. And as the chief said, we, we have a lot of resources that we've put out there now. Many of these have been funded through grant opportunities, which is great. Um, but they're only as good as how many people you can get to sign up to use them. So we really need people to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else under public comment? We have the minutes of April 8th, 2013. Are there any corrections or omissions? 
Thank you, Sharon, for a comprehensive report. And it's always <laughs> detailed and explained for me. Thank you. If there are no corrections or omissions, the chair will accept them as written. Is there a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Thank opposed? You. We are adjourned. Aye.